Hello, pupils. It's me, Dr. Lyons. Who else would it be? Uh, and what we're doing in this video lecture is we're going to go into the second part of, the, of chapter 17. So that's the chapter that is all about animals. So in the, last chap in the last part of chapter 17, we talked about general characteristics of animals. We talked about the type of symmetry that animals can have. We talked about what tissues are and how some animals have those. And we talked about some of the, the groups of animals. We talked about sponges, we talked about cnidarians, we talked about some of the worms. Uh, and then in this uh, video lecture, we're gonna talk about the rest of the animal groups. Uh, and, and then that'll be all you need to know uh, about, the, about the animals, okay? So the first group that we're gonna talk about are the arthropods. Uh, so these are the, the animals that look kind of like this. They're things that are kind of hard and crunchy on the outside. Uh, they have legs, right? So anything you can think of that is hard and crunchy outside uh, and has legs that can kind of move around uh, in general is an arthropod, right? So arthropods include crabs, they include lobsters, they include shrimp. Uh, they also include some uh, other types of shrimp, these are both what are known as cleaner shrimps that will actually go into the mouths of larger coral reef fish and clean uh, parasites out of their mouths. This is what's known as a mantis shrimp. Uh, it's really cool because it, uh, uh, it has really weird vision. It has more cones in, it, in its eyes, so it sees color in a very different way from us. And how it subdues its prey is by beating the crap out of them, by using these punching uh, glove-like things that it has on, it, on its claws. Uh, and this is just a, a weird type of crab that uses these frilly-like things that you see there and there to, to just grab small stuff out of the, out of the water. So arthropods are, are a pretty successful uh, group of organisms. Uh, something about their, their body plan has been really good for exploiting a lot of habitats on Earth. Uh, and what their body plan looks like uh, is, first of all, they're segmented. So we learned about what it means to be segmented in the context of annelids. So those were the segmented worms. Uh, and to have segments means that you have individual units running the length of your body, right? So we talked about how a worm is, is made up of many compartments running the length of its body. So it's the same with arthropods. It's the same with things like crabs and lobsters and shrimps and insects and bumblebees and, and all of those things that are arthropods. Uh, however, what sets apart the arthropods that are segmented from the annelids which are segmented is that arthropods have appendages and those appendages are jointed. So the word arthropod means jointed foot, right? So if you think of, so, so what I want you to do is think of the condition arthritis, right? And so arthritis is a condition that affects your joints, right? It, it gives people joint pain. Typically when, when people get, a, get older, they sometimes have arthritis. So arthro means joints and pod means foot. So for instance, a tripod is a, is a three-legged thing that holds up a camera or, or, a, or a camcorder. Uh, and so arthropods uh, have jointed appendages. So what that means is that, the, is that not only they have legs and arms, but they can move those legs and arms. They can bend them around. So like a crab, for instance, it can move its, its claws around and it can open and close its claws because there are joints throughout its claws. Uh, and, and something about having jointing, jointed appendages and having segmented bodies uh, has allowed for the arthropods to be very, very successful. Uh, and, and those features, in addition to having hard outer skeletons, which give them good protection, uh, has led to there being tons and tons of arthropods on, on the planet. So here is a, a you know, basic diagram of what an arthropod looks like. So typically arthropods have a head uh, segment. So there's the head, the, they have a, a thorax segment, that's this one here, and then they have an abdomen segment. Uh, and so, so you see there are those three different segments there. And then within the abdomen, there's smaller kind of segments. Uh, and then there are the appendages that I was talking about. So, so for instance, here's the, uh, the crushing claw of a lobster, right? So there's a joint right there, there's a joint right there, there's one right there, and there's a joint right there. Meaning that this, uh, that this claw can be moved around uh, in, all, in all manners. The same with the antenna, uh, so that the antenna there uh, can get moved around in, 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 all, in all directions. Same with the eyes, same with these legs. 
right? So they, they have a lot of parts that they can kind of move around to, to get around in, in their environment. Uh, and so there's four major groups of arthropods that I, that I want to mention. So the first are the arachnids and the, the relatives of the arachnids. Uh, so probably a lot of you are familiar with, with, uh, with this term arachnid. Uh, it refers to spiders. So for instance, there was a really bad movie, a really bad horror movie from the 90s called Arachnophobia, uh, which is, uh, which is the, the fear of spiders. So arachnids include the spiders. They include uh, these tiny little, tiny little ticks, which tend to be very small, uh, but can sometimes be dangerous because they, they carry disease on them. Uh, scorpions are, are types of arachnids. And then there's this marine group of arachnids uh, called horseshoe crabs, uh, which are noteworthy because they have, they have remained unchanged for a very, very long period of time. There are fossils of horseshoe crabs going back roughly 350 million years uh, that, uh, that are pretty much identical to how horseshoe crabs look today. So something about this just very simple body plan, just having this hard uh, kind of kind of cap on the top and then legs under underneath. So like there's legs and a mouth underneath here. Something about that body shape uh, has just been really good and it's just held up over time uh, because these things are some of the, the most ancient unchanged animals on the on the planet. Uh, for context, our species is is about 190,000 years old. Whereas these things have been around for about 350 million years. So horseshoe crabs are kind of remarkable for that. So these are the, the arachnids. Okay, probably my favorite group of arthropods are the crustaceans. Uh, and, and probably why I like them the most is because they are, they're the ones that you mostly find in marine ecosystems. Uh, and so they include things like crabs, they include shrimp, they include lobsters. Right, so while it's some of the most delicious things you can eat from the ocean are, are crustaceans. Uh, and then it includes some lesser known groups. Uh, so it includes things like copepods uh, and amphipods. Uh, and even though most people have never heard of these two types of animals, these are actually some of the most abundant animals on the, on the ocean, uh, or in, in, in really the most abundant animals on the planet. So, uh, so these things are microscopic. Uh, and they and they either are, are kind of buried in the sand on the sea floor uh, or they're swimming around in open ocean uh, uh, in the in the ocean. Uh, and so copepods in particular are very, very abundant. They're, they're some of the most abundant animals on the on the planet. And because of that, they're really important because they form the basis of, of a lot of food chains in the in the ocean. Uh, isopods are, are a group that are mostly known for being parasites for kind of latching on to uh, to the um, to the outsides of larger fish and, and parasitizing them, uh, and then barnacles are, are probably the least known group of, of these, or maybe they're the least known group of these. Uh, barnacles you've maybe come across before. So if you've ever been to a, a rocky beach, um, you you probably were around them and maybe you just didn't even notice them. Uh, but they tend to be really really small. Uh, they grow on top of rocks. Uh, and in general, they look kind of like little volcanoes. Uh, and so they are kind of unique amongst these other crustaceans in that they are sessile. So they attach to the seafloor and they don't go anywhere. Whereas the rest of these things can, can move around. Uh, and barnacles are noteworthy for one kind of interesting uh, uh, reason. So all of these animals, they all have sex, right? So they all, you know, males and females come together uh, and, and there's something kind of like, like copulation. Uh, and so they, they actually, uh, a male crustacean actually has to deposit sperm into a female crustacean. And for all of these, that's pretty easy to do because they can just move and they can, and they can find another uh, individual and have sex with them. However, like I said with barnacles, they're stuck to the sea floor. So they, they stay in place. So what do you do when you have to get your sperm into another barnacle, but your barnacle is a long ways away from you? So the, what barnacles have come up with to deal with that situation is a super long penis. So I know you're all giggling right now and that's fine. You can giggle away. Uh, but this is actually, I'm not actually making this up, believe it or not. So barnacles, how they, they have sex is they extend their super long penises outside of their, their shell 
they reach it over to their nearest neighbor and then they stick their, their penis into their nearest neighbor. Uh, and by the way, barnacles are si simultaneous hermaphrodites, so every barnacle does this. So it's not as if there's just males that are, that are doing this. You know, all barnacles are essentially both male and female at the same time. Uh, so they're all sticking their extra long penises out of their bodies and inseminating uh, their, their, their neighboring barnacles around them. So uh, in terms of, of penis length to body length, barnacles have the, the biggest penises of all animals. So their penises can be 20 times the length of their of their bodies. Uh, and, and that's uh, and so that's kind of a kind of an interesting fact. There's some good bar trivia uh, for you, you know, if you're old enough to go to bars, that is. So anyway, those are the crustaceans. OK, the next group I wanted to talk about are the millipedes and the centipedes. So millipedes are these little guys over here. Uh, so they tend to be herbivorous, so eating plants. Uh, and they have two sets of legs for each one of their segments. So for each one of these red lines that you see here, there are two sets of legs. So there's four legs there, uh, which is why they have a lot of legs and why they're called millipedes. So the, the term millipede means a thousand legs, which they don't always have, a, a, you know, a thousand legs, uh, but they do have a lot of legs. Uh, in contrast, centipedes have a lot of legs, but they only have one pair of legs per segment. So here is one segment, uh, and there are the, the, the one pair of legs, so two legs in, in total. Uh, so the word centipede means 100 legs. They don't have quite 100 legs, just like a millipede doesn't have quite a 1,000 legs. But they do have a lot of legs, although less than a, a millipede. Uh, and centipedes uh, tend to be carnivorous, right? So they, they, they hunt and, and kill things. Uh, some of them can have a very nasty venom in them that you that you wouldn't want to get bit by one of them because they can be quite painful. Uh, my understanding is that they're not life threatening, uh, but uh, uh, but they would be quite painful. Although I don't think we really have any any really nasty centipedes uh, in uh, in in Southern California. Okay, finally, probably the the probably in terms of abundance, the most important. Uh, type of arthropod are the insects. So if you were to just look at all of the animals on the planet, right, so all of the animals that we're talking about in chapter 17, so sponges and mollusks and worms and chordates and sea stars, if you look at all of the animals, 70% of them are insects. So insects are, are a hugely successful group of animals uh, that have really come to dominate uh, the, the, the terrestrial parts of the of the earth uh, and a lot of why they've, they've become so good at dominating areas is they have wings right so in addition to having like a nice hard outer skeleton that protects them and having these legs and, and arms that they can kind of move around and bend they also have wings which allows them to get around a lot more easily so insects are are, are by far the most diverse group of, of animals there is a huge a huge amount of them and when you start to think of things that aren't insects, you know, you can kind of see why there are so many of them, right? So all of the butterflies are insects. All of the ants are insects. All of the moths are insects. All of the bees are insects, right? Most of the things that you would refer to as a bug is an insect. Uh, with the exception of things like spiders and scorpions and ticks, pretty much everything that you would refer, would refer to as a bug is an insect. So there are lots and lots and lots of insects out there. OK, the next group of animals that I want to talk about uh, are the echinoderms. Uh, so now we're moving away from the arthropods. Uh, so we covered those four types of arthropods. Now we're going to cover the echinoderms. Uh, and the echinoderms include these things. So they include sea stars and some of their relatives. So these things, as I think a lot of you know, are quite slow. So they're not racing along the, the sea floor uh, and they're not racing along over the land because they're not even found on land. Uh, they're very slow and they're actually predatory. Uh, so what sea stars will do, like this type of sea star, which is what is known as the ochre sea star, uh, it will kind of envelop uh, mussels and, and pull them apart uh, and then eat the soft, uh, yummy bits inside. So a mussel is a type of bivalve that has two shells, uh, and sea stars are strong enough that they can pull those shells apart and eat the soft mussel within. 
So these are only found in the in the ocean. So if you want to see one of these guys, if you want to see Patrick's sea star, you're going to have to go into the ocean. Uh, and kind of the interesting, probably the most interesting thing about these uh, is that when they're adults, they're radial, right? So you can see there's like a central point and everything radiates out from that centralized point. However, when they're juveniles, they are bilateral. So they actually metamorphose from being bilateral, from having a left and a right side, to being radial, so having, having a circular sort of symmetry. So they undergo a pretty major metamorphosis between their juvenile stages and their, uh, and their adult stages. So if you've ever picked up a, a sea star, you have felt that it has kind of a hard, uh, well, it's, it's soft on the outside, but then it's kind of hard inside. And that's because there are hard plates uh, underneath the skin of, of a sea star. Okay, uh, and so what actually allows sea stars and other echinoderms to move around uh, is a very novel system inside of them that is very much unique to them. So they have this thing called a water vascular system. Uh, and how that kind of works is that there are tubes that run throughout the body of a sea star or of any type of echinoderm. Uh, and, uh, and what those tubes do uh, is that muscles essentially push that water around those tubes. It pushes that water throughout their system. Uh, and what they can do is they can push water into these things known as tube feet. Uh, and when they do that, that causes the tube foot to kind of stick out from the, the sea star. Uh, and, and typically at the end of those tube feet, there are these little suction cup sort of things. So what they do is they use this water vascular system to push their tube feet in and out. Uh, so they can kind of stick them out to, 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 or push them out to stick onto a surface and then they can release them from that surface and, and then pull them back in. Uh, and so the, the combined effort of this water vascular system and moving water around along with muscles allows for them to, to move around very, very slowly. Uh, so there, it's really a, a pretty unique system. There's not really any other animal that has anything like this, right? So instead of having just, you know, we think of sea stars as just having five arms, but in fact, they have hundreds, if not thousands of small feet underneath them. Uh, and they have to coordinate the movements of all of those feet, which is remarkable because they don't have a central brain. Uh, you would think that you would have to have a very complex brain to, to coordinate the movement of all of those feet, uh, but they actually are able to do it without the, the benefit of a brain. So they're really a pretty, pretty interesting group, right? So even though Patrick C. Star may be, you know, the, maybe the most, not the most intellectually uh, uh, gifted character on SpongeBob, uh, sea stars still do some, some pretty cool things. Uh, for instance, one thing that sea stars do that is kind of cool is they can regenerate. Uh, so this is a, a picture that I took, and, and I might have gone a little overboard with the photoshopping, but whatever. Uh, and so what you see is a sea star that has one really long arm. And so what essentially happened here uh, is is a sea star that had five arms of the length of this large arm, it basically lost that one arm. And then that one arm then grew a whole new sea star from that, that one arm that, that went missing. Uh, so they're able to, to regenerate uh, uh, their entire bodies or, or regenerate lost limbs. So that there's another, you know, so there's another sea star out there that has four limbs of this size and then has one small limb because uh, essentially that sea star is the one that lost this one arm right here. So an ability to regenerate is kind of a cool trick that, that, uh, that echinoderms have. Uh, so echinoderms include uh, uh, kind of four main groups. So there are the, the sea stars, like that one there. There are the sea cucumbers, uh, the sea urchins, and then there's kind of a, a unique group known as the crinoids. Uh, and, and so how these are all kind of different from each other is, uh, is mostly in, in how they, how they feed. So sea stars tend to be carnivores, right? So they eat, uh, animals off the sea floor. Sea cucumbers are deposit feeders. So they, they eat small bits of food that have been deposited onto the sea floor. They're kind of like little vacuum cleaners or little Roombas that move around on the sea floor and eat dead, you know, small dead particles off the sea floor. 
Sea urchins tend to be herbivores, so they eat algae off of, they scrape algae off of surfaces. In crinoids, what they do is they wait for small particles that are in the water to drift up to them. And they use these kind of feathery appendages in order to uh, trap those particles as they, as they drift by. So each of the four different types of, of echinoderms kind of do something different in terms of their feeding. Okay, so that leaves us with one then major group to, to discuss, and those are the chordates. And so these include some of the things that we're a little more familiar with because now we're getting to the group that we are a part of, right? So us humans and, and mammals in general are chordates. Uh, and chordates include other things like sea turtles and various types of, uh, of fishes. So the, the things that, that unify all of the chordates uh, so every chordate has a, uh, a hollow nerve cord along the dorsal side. So dorsal is your back. Uh, and so like this is the, the back of, of a type of animal known as an amphioxus. Uh, and so it has this nerve cord along its back. Uh, that is what we would typically refer to as a spinal cord, right? So we have the spinal cord that is part of our, our, our central nervous system, which we use for coordinating movements throughout our bodies. Uh, all chordates have a notochord. Uh, so a notochord is a hard rod that runs the, the length of the back of a chordate. Uh, and so for us, because we are vertebrates, we also have a, a backbone along here. We have a vertebral column. Uh, so we don't really use our, not our notochord so much uh, because we have the, you know, this hard backbone for our support. But there are other chordates that don't have a backbone that use their notochord as a, as a hard support system along their back. Okay, all chordates have uh, pharyngeal slits, uh, maybe not throughout their whole life, but through part of their life. Uh, those are things kind of like related to gills. There are these small slits that, uh, that are kind of tied into the, into the mouth. Uh, and so for things like fishes, uh, they actually, you know, use these things in terms of as gills. For us, we have something kind of like them when we're very, very small individuals still inside of our moms, but then we, you know, lose them uh, very early in development. Uh, and then finally, all chordates have a, a post-anal tail, right? So there's the anus, so that's the butt, and then there's a tail behind it. Uh, even us, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a tailbone, uh, and when we're very, very small and developing, we have something of a, of a post-anal tail. You know, most of us lose that, you know, as we, you know, as we develop, you know, but sometimes humans are grown are, are born with a kind of a small tail, you know, coming out from uh, from their collarbone. So all chordates have this tail kind of behind their their butt. All right. So those are the four characteristics that chordates have. So let's talk about some of the different groups of chordates. So we'll start with the, the simplest ones. Right, so the simplest ones are the tunicates or in the lancelets. So that picture I just showed you of that sort of cartoon of a chordate, that's this thing right here, a lancelet. Um, another word for that is amphioxus, which I had mentioned in the in that last slide. So lancelets and tunicates are the simplest of, of the chordates. Right, so like I just said, uh, and so these are the types of chordates that are lacking of a backbone. Right, so they don't have a vertebral column like, like we do. Right, so within the chordates, there are things that don't have a backbone. So these things, lancelets and tunicates, and there are things that do have a backbone uh, like us. Okay, uh, and so with these, you can kind of see how this would be like a relative of us because it kind of looks like a fish, right? So lancelets are, are a little bit more chordate-like than our tunicates. With a tunicate, you know, this is what they look like as adults. Right, so it's kind of hard to see how this could look like anything that is a relative of us or like a relative of, of a fish. Uh, and the reason why that is the case is because this is an adult tunicate. But as a juvenile, a juvenile tunicate looks kind of like a sperm cell, right? So it looks like something kind of more similar to this, or, or it looks almost maybe, maybe something kind of like a, like a tadpole. So as juveniles, tunicates have uh, chordate features. But then when they're adults, they, they lose those, those chordate features. Uh, so that is, that is why uh, this thing that really doesn't look a whole lot like us is actually more closely related to us than a lot of the other groups that we have, we have talked about. 
Uh, and so both of these, they, they use their, their, their pharyngeal slits that I just mentioned for feeding. So the pharyngeal slits here are what the, the lancelet uses for feeding on small bits of food in the seafloor. Uh, and in what tunicates do is their pharyngeal slits are inside of their body here and they basically suck in water one through one hole, run it over those pharyngeal slits and, and gather any of the small particles in the water on it and then spit water out the, the other hole. So they are, they are filter feeders, kind of like the, the bivalves and the, and the sponges that we talked about earlier. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the, the group of chordates that have a backbone, right? So the, the vertebrate chordates, which include us. So there are, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a few different types of, of vertebrates that we'll talk about, right? So, so, you know, if you go back far enough, so this is kind of the, the, where the common ancestor for all of the chordates are. And so chordates include these very simple types of, of chordates, so lancelets and tunicates. Uh, and then we get, starting here, into the, the vertebrates, so the ones that have backbones. Uh, and then here, we get into the ones that, uh, that actually live up on land. All right. So we've already talked about these, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the watery types of vertebrates, and then we'll talk about the land-based vertebrates. So, so first we'll talk about the fishes. So these are the, the water-based uh, 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 vertebrates. Uh, so these were the first vertebrates uh, to evolve, right? So they came first and then all of the other vertebrates came afterwards, right? So essentially uh, uh, there was one, one lineage of fishes essentially became amphibians uh, and then that gave rise to all the other land-based vertebrates. So of course, fishes are, are vertebrates very much different from us, right? So they have gills for breathing, they have scales for protection, they have fins for moving around. Uh, whereas we have, you know, lungs for breathing, we have skin for protection, uh, and we have legs and arms for moving around, right? So they're, they're very different from, from us in, in, in their behavior and how they, you know, how they live, which makes sense because they live in the water as opposed to up on land. So there's kind of three different groups of fishes that I want to talk about. So the first are what are known as the jawless fishes. Uh, you will see these also referred to as the agnathan fishes. Uh, so that's uh, A-G-N-A-T-H-A-N. Uh, and that word agnathan means jawless. So these things are fishes that lack a hinged jaw. So it's not that they don't have a mouth, it's just that they don't have a jaw that moves up and down. Right? They don't have like a lower jaw that can, that can move up and down. Uh, and so in these pictures, so this is a hagfish, right? So it is a type of jawless fish. And these dark things are lampreys. This larger thing is a, is a, is a different type of fish, but this is a lamprey. Uh, in these things, which tend to be either scavengers like hagfish or parasites like lamprey, what they do is, is they have kind of, of, of a circular shaped mouth with, with teeth that are kind of facing inward. Uh, and they'll just kind of like grab onto something and kind of twist their bodies to pull chunks of flesh off of it. Uh, because they don't have the, the benefit of a mouth that can open and close like this trout does. Right? So this trout can open and close its mouth in order to chew on things. Uh, whereas this thing can't. So it just kind of sucks onto things and then just kind of spins itself around. It's almost kind of like, um, like imagine like a cookie cutter, right? So you like, you roll out a, a, a you know, you roll out the, the cookie dough and then you use a, a, you know, a cookie cutter to kind of like cut into the dough and pull a piece off of it. That's kind of how the, the mouths of these things work. So that's a, that's a jawless fish. Okay, let's talk about uh, cartilaginous fishes. Uh, so these are, are the fishes uh, that instead of having a skeleton made of bone, uh, like other fishes do, uh, they have a skeleton made of cartilage. So they, they have a, a jaw, so they're a little bit more advanced than the jawless fishes, uh, but they have a skeleton of cartilage. Um, by the way, jawless fishes, they also have a skeleton of, uh, made of cartilage, but jawless fishes lack a mouth, lack a, a, a jaw, whereas these things do. Right, so, so sharks, like this nurse shark, rays, like these stingrays, uh, skates, which you 
you know, if, if you spent uh, much time at the beach in Southern California, there's a good chance that you've seen a skate. Uh, these are all types of cartilaginous fishes. And so nowhere within the skeletal system of these animals do you actually find any hardened bone. Uh, it's all cartilage in there. Uh, and so we do have cartilage in some places in our skeletal systems, uh, particularly like around our joints to absorb impact, like uh, between the upper and lower parts of your legs. So in your knee, there's cartilage to absorb impact. There's some cartilage between your vertebrae. Uh, there's some in your nose, which is why, you know, your nose is flexible. There's some in your ear, which is why your ear is flexible. Uh, so we do have some cartilage within our bodies, as do uh, the bony fishes, which we'll get to next. Uh, but there are some fishes, such as these cartilaginous fishes, uh, and such as the uh, jawless fishes, uh, that actually have um, uh, that actually are made entirely of cartilage. Uh, this is one of my favorite types of jawless fishes. This is a uh, a giant manta ray that was probably about ten feet across. Uh, and this is me, you know, absolutely peeing my pants with joy that I get to be around a, a giant manta ray. Okay, so let's talk about the last group of fishes. Uh, and so these are the bony fishes. So these are the fishes that you would think of when you think of the word fish, right? So things like tuna, like salmon, like trout, like marlin, uh, like swordfish, like bass, right? Those are all types of bony fishes. Or like this cute little guy, this is what's known as a grouper. So it is a bony fish. So they have a, skeleton, a skeletal system made of bone, unlike the other two fishes that we talked about. And they have one other feature that those other fishes don't have. They have what's known as a swim bladder. So inside of them, they have this pocket uh, that they can pump air into and take air out of. Uh, and the, the use of that is that by pumping air in, it makes them float up to the surface. By taking air out, it makes them sink down. So depending on what they want to do, they can pump air in and out of their swim bladder to control their buoyancy. Uh, to control whether they're floaty or sinky. Uh, so they have that kind of nice feature. Okay, so now we're going to go up onto land. Uh, but it is worth mentioning that, that where the land-based vertebrates, the land-based four-legged vertebrates, so tetrapods, the, the word tetrapod means four-legged, where they came from were the fishes. Uh, and we actually talked about a, uh, a fossil uh, a, known as tiktolic that is kind of a in-between state uh, that kind of shows us how uh, how you went from a, a, what's known as a lobe finned fish to a very early type of amphibian that would have been moving around on land so tiktolic is kind of like the bridge between these two different uh, uh, types of vertebrates so the first vertebrates to be up on land were the were the amphibians uh, and so they're the first uh, they include things like salamanders, like frogs, like newts, so those sorts of things. Uh, and so these things uh, have to stay wet. The reason why is because they have lungs that they use for breathing, but they also breathe through their skin. So if the skin of, of an amphibian dries out, uh, it can't breathe, actually, uh, which is why we don't see so many amphibians here in, you know, in, in, the, in the valley. Uh, because it's a little too dry for them here. Uh, another reason why you only find them uh, in wet areas is because their eggs need water, right? So they need to either lay their eggs inside of a pond or a river or a stream or whatnot, or they have to lay it in some very, very wet place, like, like underneath the leaves of a tree in a tropical rainforest, you know, where, where the, the bottom of those leaves are going to stay wet all the time. So their eggs need to stay in water, otherwise they will dry out. Uh, and of course, amphibians are known for one of the most major metamorphoses, uh, you know, in the animal kingdom, right? So you start with a tadpole. So this is what a tree frog tadpole looks like, right? So it, it obviously looks a lot more like a fish, uh, but then it, uh, it loses its tail, it loses its gills, it grows lungs, uh, and then it sprouts four legs and becomes an adult tree frog. So it undergoes a pretty major change. Okay, the next group that we'll talk about are the reptiles. Uh, and so reptiles includes uh, the typical reptiles that you would think of, things like 
lizards and snakes and turtles and uh, and crocodiles and alligators. Uh, but birds are also technically reptiles uh, because birds, uh, their ancestors are dinosaurs and dinosaurs were types of reptiles. So birds are also technically reptiles. So the thing that separates the reptiles from the amphibians is that they have something known as an amniotic egg. So with their eggs, uh, their eggs are hard on the outside and they have fluid inside of them. Uh, and so that fluid filled kind of sac uh, inside of the egg around the embryo is called the amnion. And what that allows reptiles to do is to lay their eggs in dry places. Right. So that's why you can find reptiles, you know, in Southern California and in deserts. It's because they don't need to lay their eggs in water. And also reptiles don't use their their skin to breathe. Uh, so that's that's why you can find them in a, in a lot drier habitats as opposed to amphibians that are really going to be found in very, very wet habitats. Right. So these are, of course, the, the types of reptiles that I just mentioned a, a, a minute ago. Uh, of course, reptiles have uh, either scales or feathers for, you know, for protection and for keeping warm and, and, and for flight in the case of birds. Uh, they, of course, have gill, not, not gills, sorry. Uh, they, of course, have lungs for, for breathing. Uh, and within reptiles, you start to see um, some kind of different ways of regulating temperature that we haven't talked about in other animals. So in, all, in most of the other animals that we talked about up until now, uh, they are what are known as ectothermic. So ecto meaning outside, therm meaning temperature. So ectotherms are animals that we would typically call cold-blooded. Right. So all the heat that they generate, they just release to the environment around them. And so most reptiles are ectothermic and most fishes are ectothermic and most things that don't have backbones are ectothermic. So they just lose their heat to the environment uh, around them. However, birds are the first group that we're going to talk about that are endothermic. Right. So they, they keep a lot of the heat that they produce on the inside. So the inside of a bird is warm, whereas the inside of a crocodile is cold, right? So birds are, are warm blooded. Uh, this is maybe one of my favorite types of reptiles. This is what's known as a, uh, a flying lizard. Uh, so I, I took this picture in a, in a jungle in, in Indonesia. Uh, and what this thing will obviously do is when it gets frightened or has a territorial dispute with another flying lizard, it will leap through the air and then glide you know, to another tree or, or to the forest floor. Okay, so let's talk about the, the mammals, right? So, so we are endothermic, right? So we're nice and warm on the inside and we're amniotic, meaning that, uh, that the, the young individuals, as they are growing and developing, they're inside of amniotic fluid. They're, they're inside of a fluid, which is why mammals can occur in, in dry places. Uh, of course, we have hair. That's one of the, the major ways that we distinguish between mammals and other types of, of uh, vertebrates. Uh, and the thing that we're, that we're mostly known for is mammary glands, right? So these are, of course, breasts, uh, and these are what uh, are used to produce milk uh, to nourish uh, young mammals, right? So this is a, a key part of being a mammal, and it's why we are called mammals. And so there's kind of three major groups of, of mammals that I want to talk about. Uh, so there are the, the eutherians, uh, which includes us. So we, we and the rest of the primates are eutherians, uh, meaning that, we, that when we are born, we are more or less fully developed, right? Of course, we are still going to grow and develop over time, uh, but we are not embryonic anymore, right? So we're, 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 we pretty much... You can pretty much tell by looking at uh, at a baby uh, a horse at a at a newborn foal. You can tell that it's a horse. Whereas in the case of marsupials, so all of those those funny mammals that live in Australia, things like kangaroos and wallabies and dingoes and things like that, when they are born, they're still very much embryonic. So they still have a lot of a lot of uh, uh, development uh, to to go. So that's why kangaroos have pouches uh, and, and all those other marsupials have pouches because then the, the, the little baby here, the little joey uh, baby kangaroo uh, can stay inside that nice pouch and continue to develop 
uh, outside of the uterus of this mama kangaroo. Uh, and then the, the, the weirdest group of these, uh, of the mammals, are what are known as the monotremes. So these things, they have hair, they have mammary glands, uh, but they have the bill of like a, a bill like a bird, uh, and they're actually born from eggs like a reptile. Uh, and so this kind of shows us, you know, where we came from, right? So mammals, we descended from one group of reptiles. So kind of like the birds descended from reptiles, we also descended from reptiles, which you can kind of see here because, you know, there's this one group of mammals that actually lays eggs like a reptile does. Uh, and so those are the monotremes and, and they don't include too many groups. Most of the monotremes have gone extinct, uh, but duckbill platypi are, are one type of, of monotreme. Uh, why they're called monotreme, you're probably wondering what, what the mono part is. So, so mono means, means one, uh, and they're called monotremes because they have what's known as a cloaca, right? So whereas the rest of the, the, the mammals here, Right, so so down, you know, around our naughty bits, we have two holes, right? So we have a, a butt, and then we have, you know, and then we have another hole for, for peeing and, and for all the reproductive stuff, right? So we have two holes, whereas monotremes, they just have one. They have what's known as a cloaca. So they have one hole that, that is connected to both the anus and to the, 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 and to the, the urine bladder and all the reproductive stuff. So that's another way that they are more similar to reptiles because reptiles have cloacas and fish have cloacas, whereas the rest of the mammals, we have, you know, an anus that is separate from, you know, from what we use for, for peeing and for, and for sex. Okay, so those are all the, the, the mammals. Uh, and uh, uh, and you, you'll see in the, the, or I think you'll see in the, the, the study questions in the lecture outline some stuff about primates. Uh, sometimes I go into more detail on, on primates, but I, I don't think I'm going to do that here uh, because, you know, if you really want to learn a lot more about primates, it's, it would be best to take an anthropology class uh, where, you're, where you will really learn, you know, all the ins and outs in the evolution of primates. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to stop there with our discussion of, of animals. Uh, and so that kind of ends our, our, our chapters on, on the, the different groups of living things on the planet. Uh, so in the, the next set of chapters, we're going to start to talk about ecology. So we're going to start to talk about how different groups of organisms interact on the planet and what are the, the consequences for that.